presentation a bit. Um, so when I was in India, I was still an architect, um, wearing the fashion of the day, you know, torn jeans and khadi kurta. And uh, the most fascinating experience was uh, going to the Randolph uh, Kutch, uh, a desert uh, vernacular settlement, and learning from them how to build with hand the mud houses and do the interior design uh, with beautiful colors and mirror. Uh, it was much later than I, it's like well, through education in Singapore and Australia. And actually, everybody asked me, why are you going to Singapore when everybody's going to America for higher education? And well, I'm like, you know, that's a bit of rebel in me. Um, so I'll try to learn things and uh, maybe the hard way sometimes. Uh, but I have been doing green networks for sustainability. It's like trying to understand after architecture, it's like, you know, what's the landscape around it? It's like, how do you connect the architecture um, in a place with landscape and how does it become ecological has been a constant uh, exploration of mine. <coughs> Done the green network exploration from ecology perspective and social perspective and creative uh, perspective. We even some, some of my students even came up with this idea in Australia. It's like, hey, how about green network for the school bus? It's like in my neighborhood we have a school bus and, and the kids, uh, which are like, you know, from five to six, no, yeah, which are five to eight, uh, that was a school bus run. They forget the path sometimes if they are not holding the train, if they are not holding the bus. And we designed a landscape, a network, a green network design to for memory for those kids. So uh, after having done all those projects and coming to Baltimore, the land of Olmsted, uh, we did many more exciting projects here. You know, went out into the community, did design shirts, really talked to the community, and uh, drew many more green lines, corridors, and hubs. Uh, and I have to say, we have a fantastic bunch of students here. Uh, at the end of the project, they know more about the place than us, and we just go like, how? Uh, so two weeks ago, I was uh, challenging myself. It's like, OK, do I want to show my projects that have been done here? It's like where we have drawn the, you know, of course, critically analyzed thought about you know the green networks which uh, which draw the correct line okay which connect the correct hubs and uh, which give provide the most to the community uh, uh, so the, in terms of social economic and ecology would they work best and I thought maybe we need uh, maybe we need new need a new framework to draw these lines you know it's like uh, and, and so that's where this uh, uh, presentation is coming from, you know, trying to figure out, is there a new framework possible even? So my questions to date have been uh, about Greeny and uh, who started the, the, the father of, you know, the Green Networking you refer, I refer to plenty others. Uh, visions on green networks and the frameworks, underlying frameworks, uh, emerging you know, theories and frameworks, and came up with this uh, new fr integrated framework of mine. And it was like, aha, I got it. Maybe it's like, this is something you know, that convinces the city planners and the, the, the developers also to it's like, you know, buy into the idea of green network. Because the green network has three evils which it suffers from. A is the big thing about land acquisition. How do you acquire land uh, for all those huge green connections? Two is political will. As, as Tom said, to, political will is essential and underlying. And it's like, you know, that is what was underscored by Mark's presentation also. So, and then the third one is about the funding. Where does funding come from for such, you know, large scale uh, greening, which is, of course, ecologically uh, sympathetic and socially uh, uh, empathetic also. Uh, so this solution, it's like, you know, really um, com comes from uh, combining a lot of other frameworks, McCarthyian framework, of course, and which is uh, about, you know, Green Bay assessing Green Bay patterns, landscape suitability analysis, land valuation zone, which says that it's like, you know, of course, um, property values increase around green networks, plus the eco-civic optimization framework, which says that, you know what, However nice and beautiful green network plan it is, it's like it is not going to be sustainable even if you build it 
uh, it is not going to be sustainable if people don't love it. So that is the civic optimization part. You have to choose those green networks which people value. They are going to go there and tend those green areas. So, so that was my green network oriented, which I presented at Morgan Innovation uh, Symposium. And then I thought it's like, you know, I think the dean was uh, supporting me for that. And it's, we didn't get any political support or will <laughs> for that. So moving on, you know, you keep going. And I did realize one of the elements that is key um, um, to everything is like, you know, the social element, although which was included as ecosystemic optimization. But that trigger and intensity, we, we still needed uh, a bit more. So thinking about stability, sustainability, and criticality, uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I started reading Theorist Perbach. I, anybody heard of him, read his work? So again, this is what happens when you grow up in India being a science student and become a design professional. You know, you, you, you are infused with a lot of scientific, you, you try to integrate and infuse all those uh, paradigms and theories into your design work. Uh, so, so it is about criticality and he talks, he explains it through the Sandpal model. Now what a Sandpal model is, is uh, uh, how long can you keep dropping sand on, uh, in a pile before it uh, dissipates, right, before it breaks, and that is the point of criticality. Um, so there is that moment which we should know, it's like, you know, when you keep dropping a particle uh, on top of particle uh, before it's going to break and the process is going to start again. So that model is going to break and a new process is going to start. Uh, so these are the two things that come out of it. It's really simple process, it's accumulation and dissipation, but all it takes is one external agent. Uh, so looking at it, it's like, okay, if you uh, look at that kind of, you know, the, the idea of understanding of, of, you know, nature phenomena, how nature works, um, and you look at Baltimore maps and issues again with those eyes, um, this is the map of fatalities uh, in Baltimore, the accidents, uh, and as you would see, it's like, you know, the gray areas with higher uh, fatalities, this is the vacancies um, map, of course, we have seen it again, and as uh, Tom mentioned, 30,000 about vacancies, uh, 16,000 vacant properties, I think, and 14,000 vacant lots. That's sort of roughly the maths. Uh, so how about uh, uh, if you imagine uh, uh, the, the tree in the, the city in the image of a tree, and this is just a, a literal superimposition of a tree image here, uh, but there is a thinking going on here in the sense it's like, you know, right now the way it operates is like uh, the infrastructure, this is the green part and all the green part is away from the vacancies. Uh, that's how the physical model of Baltimore looks like. It's almost like all the, the trunk and the infrastructure is just moving through these uh, subdivisions and it's just, you know, supplying these areas. Uh, <coughs> And of course, you apply another tree, the only just the form changes, but the pattern still remains the same. So the point, the, what, what is the point of the critical point is the snapping point. It's like, you know, what is that point where you add just one more particle of sand and the pile is going to break and, and dissipate and, and it's like, uh, not to leverage on what happened, but this is a reality. It's like, you know, in Baltimore, uh, it's like, what is that tipping, what is that critical point when it's like the tree is going to snap? And uh, you know these branches are really going to break. So this is where it's like you know uh, uh, Tom's Green Network plan and Baltimore gr uh, Growing Green initiatives and uh, vacant two buildings. Everything is coming together and trying to help and build the city together. So the idea is that it's like uh, okay now the attempt is being made that is like you know all the green initiatives uh, uh, <coughs> acknowledging the work being done. Uh, all the green areas are now coming the, the, into the city um, and, and the, sub, the red area is not simply acting as passage for supplies but it is the uh, destination for supplies. How does it work? It's like it is a complex process like for a tree, how to create food from uh, using photosynthesis. It looks like a nice beautiful tree but the chemical, the physics, the Mathematical, it's like, you know, the processes, it's like the equations embedded in this phenomena are complex and images. So we have to realize that it's like what we're doing and what we have been talking about here is uh, 
Um, it is complex. It has so many moving parts, and I think it's like you know, uh, expecting uh, the outcomes and the effects to happen tomorrow is uh, um, uh, would be what do you say? It's like <laughs> not not fair. Let's leave it there. So basically, looking at uh, our uh, Baltimore City in the image of a tree, and I'm, I'm just coming to close, so uh, it's, it's almost like what is the external agent? What does a plant need? What does a tree need to survive? And it, it really is like you know, sunshine, salt, water, minerals, and how it would uh, translate into uh, uh, the, the component, the real city component. And it's like you know, okay, maybe the um, sunshine is the jobs and lifestyle, soil is supportive family and institution, education skills is water and supportive institutions and skills again is, is minerals. So what can we provide as a city uh, to plant the trees? Um, and then do we need one sun, um, one soil, one ecosystem or do we need it like if we refer to the fractal element of the tree, um, uh, where it's like the smallest component of tree, it makes the it's repeated in the larger pattern of the tree. If we took that one big tree and if we came up with you know smaller we, uh, uh, repetitions of that, so we have many more micro ecosystems repeated. Um, and if we design each of these neighborhoods, each of these marginalized neighborhoods in the image of a tree, where it has a, it has its own sun and soil and water and minerals. Do you think we have better chances of uh, uh, sustaining uh, the change? And, uh, and then once we have these suns uh, and the ecosystems, uh, uh, do they have to be same color, uh, shape, and size, or, or do they have to be it's like you know programmed differently? Do they have to be taught differently because of uh, different demography, different needs? Uh, and do you think they will have more ownership if it is thought about in terms of the programs will have more ownership and buying from community if they are very community specific? Uh, so some of the makerspace program that you will hear about later in the session, I see them as a bit of the acting as sun. Uh, but there is an issue with many solutions and makerspace programs. Is one of the thing weaknesses and flaw that you would notice is you hear about these makerspaces, you hear about the land trust and community managed open spaces, and I'm going to say the word, uh, these are very white terminologies. If I ask my African American students sometimes, or it's like, you know, not very many people know what that is. Not very many people know how to make that happen. They don't have a template to, to make these, just like, you know, uh, changes happen and then, you know, how to support them. And there are lots of complex issues around it. Um, but again, it is a real issue that we need to look at, and that's why I need to. I, I call for it's like you know thinking about tree, the city in terms of trees, but it's like you know that each uh, branch of a tree is, has probably uh, its own sun rather than just having one shared sun and their own program. So a few of the things that we need to keep in mind, I think, from Carvajal's theory of criticality and complexity, is and this is important, and I'm just going to close it in. Uh, 20 seconds per hour. The collection of species represents a single coherent organism. So that is your city right there, following its own evolutionary dynamics. So if you are going to focus on um, Harlem Park and not Roland Park, or on Roland Park and not Harlem Park, uh, they, they are going to be impacting each other. It's, it's just one ecosystem, and, and, and it has together, they have its own evolutionary dynamics. If they don't evolve together, uh, the critical point and the snapping point is going to come soon. Uh, sooner than later, a single triggering event can cause an arbitrarily large fraction of ecosystem to collapse. Something important, a single triggering event, right? We don't think about it, but it can lead to collapse of a larger ecosystem. Um, so as we said, it, it makes no sense uh, to view the evolution of individual species independently, and I would just replay species in terms of um, neighborhoods and, and that offers us lessons to design and plan. Any small change of any event will sooner or later affect everything in the ecosystem. Any small change of any event will sooner or later affect everything in the system. Uh, so with that, I close the presentation and, uh, and yeah, I just, we have many programs, how to do it in urban farms. 
that can be leveraged. It's like you know, start uh, imagining the tree as uh, uh, many micro ecosystems. So thank you for listening, and I open the.